Welcome to Unit 4 of the Modern World, Lesson 24, Post-War Modern Movements. Following World War II, the art world shifted its focus from Europe to America. Modern art had arrived on the U.S. shores as artists fled war-torn Europe. Abstract Expressionism was the dominant force that became the springboard for the constant innovation and change. This lesson covers action painting and happenings to pop and performance art. The objectives for this lesson are to identify the historical conditions that affected art in the United States after World War II, discuss abstract expressionism, and distinguish examples of action and color field painting. Recognize assemblage, happenings, and events as art forms that blurred the line between art and life, describe common techniques and themes characteristic of pop art, explain the interests and stylistic features of minimalism, express the importance of the artist's idea in conceptual art, survey artistic formats such as earthworks, installation, and performance art, which remove art from its traditional context, and demonstrate the influence of feminist thought on post-war art. The topics we'll be covering, the New York School, abstract expressionism, color field painting, architecture at mid-century, assemblage, Events and Happenings, Pop Art, Minimal Art, Conceptual Art, Site-Specific Works and Earthworks, Installations and Environments, Early Feminism, and Performance Art. A few years after World War II ended, some artists from the modern art movement in Europe began to settle in New York. For example, Salvador Dali, Marcel Duchamp, Piet Mondrian. These artists, they worked and they studied, continued to teach also over there, and helped inspire a younger generation of modern artists in America. We'll be going over a few of those artists next. They're a part of a group called the New York School. After World War II, many artists had a similar reaction to World War II as the artists before them had a reaction to World War I responding to the horrors of war and what would bring a society to the point of war. Many of these artists post-World War II stripped anything recognizable of the figure from their art and they were dealing more with color, emotion, similar to the German Expressionists. As a matter of fact, they were very inspired by the German Expressionists. Their movement was called Abstract Expressionism. One of the leading members of Abstract Expressionism was Jackson Pollock. Here we see him painting in 1950. He was part of the movement creating a type of painting called action painting where it's more about the movement of the body, not necessarily the contact of the brush to the surface. Got to still remember with all these artists that were practicing these techniques, they were fully trained in school and would be able to paint or draw anything in a realistic fashion purely through their training. This is them trying to break free of those traditions. In this slide we have a painting by Jackson Pollock titled Autumn Rhythm number 30 from 1950. This is very typical of Pollock's style. Some of this may look trivial nowadays after many of the imitators came along and made thousands and thousands of paintings that were marketed in such a fashion it kind of takes away the importance of what Pollock had done. Pollock wasn't just randomly squirting paint all over his canvases. He was very interested in Carl Jung's theories on the unconscious mind. Some of the stylings of these dripping paintings are similar in process if you think about it to the automatism of the surrealists where they were just kind of trying to let a line express themselves. The only difference is they would try to find some type of representation coming out of those lines. Pollock was not really interested in that whatsoever. Jackson Pollock unfortunately died at the age of 44 in a car accident involving drinking and driving. He had battled alcoholism throughout his life and had quite a volatile personality and also was known as a loner. Seeing that he died early, he doesn't have an immense body of work like some other artists do. 
but he also struggled with his ideas a lot and just didn't produce as much as other artists were doing. This painting is by Mark Rothko, titled Blue, Orange, Red, from 1961. Another subcategory underneath abstract expressionism arose alongside with action painting. It was called color field painting. Color field painters attempted to overwhelm the viewers with large, bold swatches of color painted on large canvases. Mark Rothko was one of the leading painters of the color field movement. With color field paintings, there is no obvious structure or narrative. It's all about conveying some sense of feeling or emotion through color, not unlike what Van Gogh did, just in a completely different sensibility that the color is all there is. The paintings of Van Gogh always had some aspect of this emotion through color in it, but his paintings always had some type of figure or, or object in it. It wasn't dealing with some of these abstract ideas like the color field painters were. In this slide we have four different paintings by artists that were working in and around the abstract expressionist movement. In the upper left hand corner we have Helen Frankenthaler's Mountains and Sea from 1952 working within the same theories that Mark Rothko was with expressing emotion through color and a lot of the action painting loose brushwork techniques that were inspired by Jackson Pollock. Lower left we have Robert Motherwell doing Elegy to the Spanish Republic. Number 34 which was made between 1953 and 1954. This was not much different than Guernica by Pablo Picasso that it was an ode to the people of the Spanish Republic during the oppression of Franco in the Spanish Civil War. This is a little bit different than most abstract expressionists because they didn't always do something with a heavy subject matter. Upper right hand corner we have William de Koning, Woman and Bicycle from 1952-1953 range. Also very loose, jagged painting style influenced by what was probably more common during the 1920s with the German Expressionists. In the lower right hand corner we have an untitled painting by Norman Lewis from 1947 working within abstract expressionism but also having some inspiration from the Cubists. We still have artists working with the roots of abstract expressionism in the 1960s well after it had begun, pop art had seemingly begun to take over in America by this time. In this sculpture by David Smith, we have the influence of the Cubists, but more toned down in the abstract expressionist style to where it's the exploration of the shapes and the objects and their relationships, but not necessarily about anything in particular. We're now moving away from abstract expressionism and on to architecture at mid-century. We've covered architecture quite a bit throughout our course, so some of these building styles should be looking familiar to you by now. All the buildings we're looking at in this slide are influenced by the international style of architecture, which was very sleek and open spaces. It's just depending on who the architect was and how they took advantage of it. The somewhat bulky looking building in the upper left hand corner is the Velasca Tower in Milan, Italy. It was referred to as a brutalist style architecture after it was built seeing that it really overwhelms the rest of the buildings around it. It is built in the international style but not as sleek as what is typically associated with. In the uh, Lower left hand corner we have Oscar Niemeyer's Planalto Palace, the presidential residence from Brazil that was built in 1960. Very sleek, looking very similar to the LAX airport and other things that were going on at the time in architecture. 
the Planalto Palace is a prime example of where form doesn't necessarily overly describe the function of the structure. The large column-like structures supporting the roof definitely add support, but they add a sleek design element to the building. And within this outer area, you have nicely contained within the open, spacious view that you can get by having the steel and glass framing your building and not all of your supports being on the outside. On the right-hand side, we have the Lever House in New York City from 1952, which is probably much more typical of the influence of the international style on the American skyscraper. You have the beautiful glass encased structure with the steel support beams, but this is not a very heavy building. When you look at the building, uh, the Velasco Tower in the upper left-hand corner is a lot smaller compared to the Lieber House, and you can see how by varying your architectural styling, how you can give a certain sensibility of visual weight. Next, we'll be looking at assemblage artists that were inspired heavily by the Dada movement. In this slide, we have two different works by Robert Rauschenberg. Rauschenberg is definitely one of the most influential artists in post-1950s America. In the upper left, we have his monogram, which is an assemblage, called it a combine painting, meaning that it combines different elements together. It was made between 1955 and 1959. Rauschenberg did work in the spirit of the Dadaists, assembling random assortments of things, and also from the synthetic cubists and collage artists from back in the time period as well. The difference is that Ra Rauschenberg started working with elements that were cast off trash, so to say, from a disposable society. That wasn't necessarily part of the aspect of the Dada artists working in that medium. They carefully chose the things that they were using in their pieces. On the right, we have Rauschenberg's Tracer from 1963, which combines the photo montage collage style of the cubists and especially the Dada such as Hannah Hoch with a contemporary style where paint is also applied to it on top. Uh, another aspect of this is many of the images in here are that of popular culture so to say, things out of magazines, the American Eagle, the helicopters which are reminiscent of what was going on during the Vietnam War which had just begun. Although this is inspired by the art of the Dada period, this does fall very much into the sensibilities that were going on in America and in England at the time where pop art rose. We'll be talking about pop art shortly. This is, again, yet castaway objects forming what is supposed to be the average American. It's titled John Doe from 1959 by Edward Keenholz. This is social commentary, but it's more a humorous jab at the American culture. In this slide, we have another example of a very influential American artist. This is by Jasper Johns, titled Target with Four Faces from 1955. Johns was very close friends coming up in the New York world with Robert Rauschenberg when they were younger in the uh, 1950s right out of art school in their heavy experimentation phase trying to figure out exactly where they were going with their art. Johns was very interested in signs and symbols in his work. In Target with Four Faces we have actually the inversion in the sense that the faces that are not normally associated with being signs are intended to be a sign and the target which is a symbol has been now converted into a painting. These are also very common everyday objects. He likes associating one with the other when they don't necessarily go together. Yet another aspect of something that is inspired more in the 
execution by the Dada artists, but not very much social commentary going on. In this slide, we have a Neo Dada work from Nikki de Saint Fowl. It's titled Saint Sebastian or the Portrait of My Love from 1960. Her style in her paintings was a little bit uh, different than other Neo Dadas. She had a lot more intent in her execution. This is a symbolic destruction of one of her own paintings where she completes it and then afterwards she goes to brutalizing her work by throwing darts at it, uh, putting nails in the clothes as you see in this particular one, splattering paint all over it, basically symbolically destroying it. She was also known for having paintings with gunshots in them as well. The Neo Dada spirit had an influence on performance art and as a result we have a category in art called events and happenings. This is a photograph from an event from 1960 titled Homage to New York, a self-constructing, self-destructing work of art. The leader of this event was Jean Tingley. It was intended to have a work of art that builds and then destructs itself, and that is it. The event is over. The only record of it that we have is that someone was able to photograph it. This event was intended to be a homage and slight criticism to our dependence on machines. It happened on March 16, 1960 at the Museum of Modern Art. This type of self-constructing, self-destructing work of art does not have the symbolism that a mandala has that is also made to be temporary and destroyed at the end. That has a symbolic significance to our life on Earth. This was more a commentary on machines. We have a happening commissioned by the Cornell University by Alan Capro titled Household. The artists were given certain objects beforehand and they went on site and there was groups of men and women that were involved in this particular project. After the components were given to the men and women beforehand, the happening actually took place at a city dump. The men built a tower, the women built a nest, and in return each wound up destroying the others in a completion of the happening. Nowadays we actually have a very popular happening event called the Burning Man which happens out west every year. Roughly about 40,000 people gravitate out there to build a giant wooden sculpture of a figure and it gets destroyed very symbolically in a giant bonfire in the end. Next to Cubism, pop art is possibly the most influential art movement of the 20th century. It had its roots in London. It started there first and then really became popular and more identified with America in the 1960s. Pop art really dealt with our fascination with celebrity and the overconsumption of products and our fascination sometimes with those products. A Campbell soup can was made very popular in the 1960s by Andy Warhol, elevating a simple everyday object to an art object, not very far from the Dada ideal. Richard Hamilton is the artist responsible for coming up with pop art. He felt that pop art should be popular, meaning it was designed for mass audiences, transient, meaning it was a short-term solution, expendable, or easily forgotten, low cost, mass produced, aimed at the youth or being young in nature, witty, sexy, gimmicky, glamorous, and reflective of the attitudes of big business, meaning mass production. This work by Richard Hamilton from 1956 is the start of the pop art movement. 
It is titled, Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing? The title itself is reflective of the pop art attitude. It sounds more like the cover of a Good Housekeeping or Better Homes and Gardens magazine. All the elements within this work are examples of pop culture, be it a consumer project like the Charms Pop or the ham and the can on the table, or the television, romance, comics, the theater that you can see outside the window, the signs, all of this leads to some type of aspect of society that is obsessed with consumer objects and celebrity. In this slide we have James Rosenquist's F-111 from 1965, an absolutely massive pop artwork. It's 10 feet tall by 86 feet wide. There's all sorts of pop art symbolism in here from the advertisements for products for tires and food products, light bulbs and the such, from symbols and things that you would see on television. Also a little bit of the wartime activity going on is being symbolized through the use of the massive F-111 spanning across the entire work. This also is meant to symbolize the giant billboards that were popping up all over America at the time. Even though they started in the 50s, billboards really took on a new use in America all over the big cities in the 1960s. Even though signs have a long history in America, they were made with some type of permanence either through neon or enameled porcelain or even tin for a while. Billboards certainly fit in with the pop art sensibility that they were temporary and one thing can be up there for two weeks, another thing for a week, another thing for a month. Certainly adds into the sensibilities of pop art. The artist that is most strongly associated with pop art was Andy Warhol. This is a work of his titled Marilyn Diptych from 1962. A diptych is a two-panel composition. Andy Warhol used silkscreen, which was a way to mass-produce images that's used commonly every day in t-shirts. It's a printmaking technique that we went over in the printmaking lesson. He also painted on top afterwards, but part of Warhol's thing is many of his works were produced in a factory atmosphere, meaning it was a group of artists working together in a warehouse. And a lot of times Warhol was the boss, directing everyone as to what to do on the paintings. He was a very interesting character and, in a sense, almost portrayed himself as a work of art or the possibility that he wasn't making art at all. The issue with Warhol is a lot of times when he was interviewed, he'd give yes and no answers to conflicting questions and there's really a lot of mystery surrounding him as a character even though he was very much out in the forefront of the world. In this slide we have two works by Andy Warhol. On the left is Little Race Riot from 1964 taking an event directly from the newspapers and television which there is your pop art sensibility but what's different about this work is it draws attention to the social unrest going on in America during the time with the civil rights movement and the fact that many people overlooked a lot of things if it was maybe exhibited in a gallery elevated to a form of art might draw more attention to the subject on the right hand side we have a self-portrait by Andy Warhol from 1966. This is very typical of his silkscreen style that became very popular with celebrities. Actually many celebrities commissioned Andy Warhol to do portraits of them ranging from Mick Jagger to Michael Jackson. There's a very famous quote from Andy Warhol from 1968. And it is, in the future, everyone will be world famous for 15 minutes. Andy Warhol always had a strange perception of 
how we are as people and always seem to be connected in a way that seems to elude other artists. And I mean that in a way when we're looking at modern television and reality TV and all these shows that peer into people's lives. Some of them come and go. Some of them do stay famous for a certain length of time, but it's kind of strange how perceptive art can be at times in this modern age. On the right-hand side of the slide, we also have another variation off of Andy Warhol's Race Riot from 1964. Uh, this is a little bit smaller. It's a screen print on Strathmore drawing paper. This painting is titled Drowning Girl from 1963 by artist Roy Lichtenstein. Lichtenstein also was a pop artist, but took a different aspect of popular culture and incorporated it into his work, and that was the art of comic books. He actually did paint these with hard lines and small little dots he called Bendai dots. A lot of these paintings are very massive. Those Bendai dots are representative of the halftone dots that are used in comic book printing and in newspaper printing as well. One of the also interesting things about these is comics are usually normally very small and he would make these very large, which really would transform them from their original intent. He also would paint direct comics, not really rewriting or having any type of social commentary other than maybe the concerns of a teenager or something that was directly taken out of an advertisement. Many of the comic books that were becoming popular at the time in 1960s America were different than the superhero comics of before where it's more everyday people. Say for example, Spider-Man was just starting out at this time and the other characters from Marvel Comics all centered around more teenage issues, sometimes, you know, popular culture issues as well with Iron Man and such, but the work of Roy Lichtenstein more focused on this teen angst aspect that was really popping up in comics. This slide we have two cheeseburgers with everything, dual hamburgers from 1962 by Klaus Oldenburg. Klaus Oldenburg definitely was on the lighter side of pop art still poking fun at American culture by taking everyday things that we consume and that are part of our everyday lives and elevating them to some type of art form. Oldenburg's work tended to be very playful in the sense that it dealt with the scale of an object taking something small and making it large taking something insignificant as a hamburger and making it into a sculpture. He also was well known for making soft sculptures like taking an object like a toilet and making it out of soft materials. Definitely also reflective of some of the Dada influence on pop art that that is a very nonsensical way of representing something. But definitely on the lighter side and always having a little bit of fun in his work. The next group of artists that we'll be looking at worked in minimal art. They were called minimalists. In this slide we have three examples of minimalist work. On the left we have Donald Judd's Untitled from 1967. On the top right we have Frank Stella's Agbatana number no. 3 from 1968. And on the lower right, we have Ellsworth Kelly's Blue, Green, Yellow, Orange, Red from 1966. The difference between the color aspects, like the two works on the right, than that from the color field artists was there was no emotional intent behind these works. It's just about the color and the design. Donald Judd's sculpture doesn't necessarily have as much color involved with it, but it's more just object oriented and there is no specific narrative or concept behind the piece other than you're supposed to look at it for its general sensibilities. Next we'll be going over conceptual art with a brief look at artist Joseph Kozef. This is a conceptual work by Joseph Kozuth titled One and Three Chairs from 1965. This was a direct response to pop art's obsession with taking 
everyday things and elevating them to an art form. But this is not necessarily pop art. If it was pop art, it would probably be the chair painted in pink and blue or something like that. This is more about a real chair, a representation of a chair in the photograph, and a definition of a chair, trying to give us a rough idea of what a chair is. Conceptual art and the events and happenings of the late 50s, 1960s really helped elevate artists to try to move beyond the art gallery and try to represent art in new forms and new conceptual ways. In this slide we have three different examples of site works and earthworks. On the left hand side we have a site work by artists Christo and Jean-Claude. This was called Running Fence. It ran in the Sonoma and Marin counties in California between 1972 and 1976. Christo and Jean-Claude financed their projects by doing conceptual designs and selling the prints to be able to pay for their projects. They're meant for people to experience and get something out of it that may differ from individual to individual. They have the tendency really to wrap a lot of buildings in the most recent years, but their early works tended to be more like this in a sparse, larger environment. On the upper right hand side of the slide we have a photograph of Walter de Maria's The Lightning Field from New Mexico that was installed in 1977. This is in a sense a mixture of site works and earthworks. It's using modern technology meaning that there are beams installed into the ground that are intended to be lightning rods and attract a natural occurrence to the earth through some type of technology and man-made manipulation. On the lower right hand side we have Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty from the Great Salt Lake in Utah in 1970. This was never meant to be permanent just to be worked with the earth and have whatever happened that might happen by Mother Nature. This goes through phases of being covered and uncovered at times. Other examples of conceptual art that we've already spoken of before in previous lessons are installations and environments where an artist is intending to give you the sense of place and time or to get you to think about a certain subject. On the left we have AMBA from 1982 by artist James Terrell. This is an installation of light, not necessarily anything physical in color but it does purvey some sense of mood that you're supposed to get out of the color. Not much different than the color field artists were doing, but this is controlled by technology and light. On the right we have a work by artist Andy Goldsworthy called Drawn Stone from 2005. Goldsworthy normally works outside in the environment 
Um, not necessarily an earthworks artist. He just works with temporary things such as twigs and rocks that come and go. And he leaves his pieces out in the environment where he installs them, takes photographs, and they're left to be dealt with by Mother Nature. This drawn stone was an example of a work that was commissioned. There's a giant crack that's leading through the center of this installation that was put there on purpose to symbolize an earthquake. The symbolic crack is a reference to the earthquake that had destroyed the museum's previous building. In this slide, we have two more stills that are examples of installations and environments from your text. On the left, we have Yayoi Kusama's Infinity Mirror Room, Phallus Field from 1965. And on the right is a still of Alice Acox, The Beginning of A Complex from 1977. In this slide we have three early feminist works. Feminism had most of its roots in the 1960s within literature where a lot of writings were happening and protests were going on alongside with the civil rights protests at the time, but it really took hold in art more in the 1970s. On the left we have The Dinner Party by Judy Chicago, which has some commentary on the role of the housewife, the place settings of dinner, and the obsession sometimes that stereotypical representations of women go through in dealing with events and organization and such. On the lower right we have The Rebirth of Venus from 1984. This is just a detail of the work. The Rebirth of Venus is a response to Botticelli's Birth of Venus that we've looked at before. This takes the naked female still in the center, but instead of having her just displaying herself as she does on the shell in Botticelli's work, she's more an active role as an athlete, something more redefining of the femininity of the figure in the original painting. On top, the artist kiss was actually a slight objection by the artist. She was not officially a part of the show that this work was in, but she installed it anyways in front of it. You have the representation of a saint also, which is a stereotypical representation of a female in a specific role. Performance art was birthed out of equal parts of expressive dance that came out of the early 1920s and of the happenings and events of the 1960s. Performances are just that. They're meant to be performances and are not meant to be anything long-lasting other than something that can be saved in the format of a film or of a photograph. We have three different examples of performance art in here. On the left we have the Tree of Life series from 1977 by Anna Mandietta. This was a little bit different than a lot of performance art pieces that it is made outside. Most of these would take place outside of a museum and within the grounds or in a sense like a happening or event, a pre-scheduled time where people can observe what's going on. On the top right we have a photo from Joseph Boy's performance, Coyote, I Like America and America Likes Me from 1974. And on the lower right we have a photograph from a performance by Guillermo Gomez Pena and Roberto Cifuentes. It was titled The Temple of Confessions from 1994. This just goes to show that not all performance art are dancers randomly outside of a museum staring off into space and trying to engage you by some type of random performance. There is some more intent, although it's not necessarily meant to be a permanent part of any type of museum or gallery. The idea is meant to be a little bit more long-lasting. This slide we have a still of a performance by the group ASCO. It was titled 
decoy gang war victim and it was performed in 1975. This performance was meant to draw attention to gang violence in the streets of Los Angeles. We are now at the end of our lesson on post-war modern movements and this also brings to an end our course on appreciation of the visual arts. Thank you for listening.